My name is Casey Hirsch. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, author, and founder of LightYourSparkle.life. I focus on integrative models of healing and empowering people to be experts on their own bodies. As many of you know, I have Crohn's disease and a history of childhood trauma. And I spend a lot of time talking about the connections between stress and health and the importance of our strengths and relationships throughout our healing journeys. I'm very excited to speak with Hala Khoury today and continue this ongoing discussion about stress, trauma, and resiliency. Hala has master's degrees in community psychology and counseling psychology. She not only leads trauma-informed yoga trainings, but she trains nonprofits and individuals on how to be trauma-informed. She studied a body-oriented approach to healing trauma and coping with stress developed by Dr. Peter Levine called Somatic Experiencing. She is the co-founder of Off the Mat Into the World, a training organization that bridges yoga and activism within a social justice framework. And as if that's not enough, Hala has a new book coming out in April called Peace from Anxiety, Get Grounded, Build Resilience, and Stay Connected Amidst the Chaos. I had the opportunity to read Hala's book and I was very inspired. I have many questions, so let's get started. Hello, Hala. Hi, Casey. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. So Hala, can you share a little bit about what inspired you to write Peace from Anxiety? Yeah, you know, I always felt like I wanted to take my work into the mainstream a little bit more broadly. And a lot of my students who had had opportunities to train with me and come to my classes were asking for more. They were also saying that they wanted to share my work with their loved ones, that their loved ones weren't able to get to class or to workshop. This was pre-COVID when not everything was online, by the way. Um, and when Shabala approached me about doing a book, it felt like it was just the right timing. I try to make all my decisions professionally about how can I best serve? Like, what's the best use of me? That's always the, ask, the question I ask myself. So writing the book felt like a really natural next step to follow my intention to make my work more accessible to more people. And so it was a really beautiful process as well. Wow. So I'm wondering, can you tell us just briefly what your book is about and what you're hoping that your readers will take away from it? Yeah. So like the title says, uh, on some level, the book is really about how to deal with anxiety. Um, for me, the book is about well-being not just personal well-being, but our interpersonal well-being and collective well-being. I always say that I feel like the book is a journey from individual well-being into collective care. It's a book that reframes what well-being is. It reframes what our anxiety might be about and gives people not just practical physical tools to manage their nervous system and their overwhelm, but also tools and information to reflect on what we think it means to be well. And how do we interrogate that a little bit? Because maybe sometimes what we are sold well-being is, is one of the causes of our pain and our discomfort. Mm. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I really like how you cover the different ways that people experience anxiety. And you mentioned that for some of us, we're so used to living with anxiety and worrying about bad things that might happen that we feel as though it's normal. And we may not even recognize that many of our physical symptoms are our body's expressions of that anxiety. Can you just talk a bit more about these ideas? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that like for many of us, our internal state, if it's been the same for a long time, just starts to feel like a norm. We sort of assume everybody feels this way all the time. It's very subconscious. So so we sort of normalize that experience. And I've worked with people who, when they've had a taste of letting some of that go, getting grounded, they've said to me like, I never even knew this was possible because I felt like this for so long, I forgot I could feel different. So not everybody has that experience, but especially when it comes to chronic levels of stress or the anxiety and the stress that we inherit you know, we're coming into this world with inheritance already. Some of it is wonderful. Some of it can feel like a weight that we take for granted exists all the time. Um, so for some people, they don't even realize that they could be feeling different. And so my hope is that this book also opens us up to other possibilities of ways of being, not just in our own skin, but with each other and in the world. 
Yeah, I completely relate to that because as a, a clinical social worker, I spend a lot of time working on, you know, how to help people with anxiety. But all along throughout my life, I was also dealing with this chronic condition, which we found out many years later was Crohn's disease. And I was one of those people who came from a really high stress environment. And I didn't realize that that's, that way of living kind of strong and very anxious was just a part of what seemed normal to me. Yeah. And I also hadn't, you know, I didn't make the connection, unfortunately, because sadly, society doesn't connect our physical, emotional, and spiritual well-beings together very well. It takes people like you and I and a bunch of other, you know, wonderful people out there in the universe who are doing that. But it was a difficult connection for me to make that so much of my anxiety was also causing me or worsening some of the gastrointestinal symptoms. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really normalized to be stressed out, right? That especially if we're trying to be productive or produce, that's often given such importance, um, even if it's costing us our well being. Right. Yeah, you describe how as a society, we're, we are too in control and it's become more acceptable to suppress our stress rather than honoring our body's natural ways of releasing stress. And I think about all the children I worked with through the years who came from homes with trauma and how they could not sit still in the classroom. And when they fidgeted or spun their pencils, they were called a distraction. What do you think about this? Yeah, you know, I work with a lot of educators and school teachers, and I, I have so much empathy for the stress that they experience trying to manage the classroom and teach their students. But the trauma-informed lens invites us to look at all the behaviors we see as an attempt to self-regulate. So if somebody's anxious, if they're feeling dissociated, they might need to fidget and move to try to ground themselves or try to Try, they're trying to manage their anxiety. So unfortunately, kids, and especially kids with color, are going to be pathologized for their behavior. And so the other piece is that there's parts of our identities, whether it's race or how somebody's brain works or gender or gender expression, that exacerbate the way that people are perceived. And we see this often in schools. So we have a baseline anxious child who's not making the teacher's job easy, right? We have an anxious teacher who's often, especially in under-resourced schools, trying to figure out how to care for everybody. And so when we can really see all of it through that lens of everybody's trying to self-regulate, we can offer tools. If that kid didn't have to fidget, they wouldn't, right? They would sit still. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you talk a lot about the use of the body as a resource. And I think some of the suggestions and examples that you use in the book are how, how important it is that we allow ourselves to have these natural releases of stress. And you talk a lot about the animal kingdom and how we, we all as just, you know, here on this earth have ways to get rid of that stress. And a lot of times it is through movement. It's through fidgeting. It's through sometimes even shaking. It's through getting up and walking around. And, you know, that has historically been viewed as something that we need to shut down. And I, I hope that overall we'll start shifting toward allowing us, ourselves, to move in our natural form so that we can, in a more healthy way, process our stress. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's this pressure to appear civilized or like we have our, our stuff together um, and this idea that like we're there's a really wonderful book called Normal Sucks that I love because the author really breaks down like there's no such thing as normal, right? And that we're all aspiring to this sense of normalcy that really isn't true for anybody and isn't authentic or helpful to anybody. So the more that we can connect, I often talk about connecting to our wildness, the parts of us that feel out of control. And, you know, we live in a, you know, especially if you're in Western, you know, Northern American culture, we're very much impacted by colonization. I mean, the whole world is impacted by colonization, which is about control, controlling what we can't control. And we've internalized that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, good point. You said a quote in Peace from Anxiety that I found to be very powerful. So I'm going to read it. You say, at some point, my obsession with fixing myself had become a new way to not actually have to be present with myself as I was. 
I had replaced numbing out with sugar, with magical thinking, self-help workshops, and detox diets. Those pesky defenses, they will come back dressed up in different outfits if we're not careful. Can you share how you realize this about yourself? Oh my gosh. You know, I remember one day my sister said to me, Hala, you need to stop self-improving. And I became so, you know, my disease, for lack of a better word, was perfectionism. I wanted, I thought if I could control things, if I could be perfect, then I wouldn't have to feel anxious about anything. And so, yeah, at first it was in ways that from the outside obviously looked um, sort of dysfunctional or not useful, right? Controlling food, controlling my body. But then even when I found yoga, I was going to control my thoughts and I was going to control my breath. There was still that need to be in control, which again is understandable. When we're overwhelmed, we want something to feel that we're in control of. So I, I think that some of those, um, the, some of those uh, self-soothing mechanisms, they're like the boat. We don't want to mistake the boat for the shore. So I did need to use yoga to manage and control my body for a while. I did need to use um, controlling my food, maybe not calorie counting, but now it had to be organic and local and whatever, right? It was still a step up in terms of the grip of the control was loosening, but I was still managing my anxiety. And until I could allow the control to give me opportunities to let go, I was going to get stuck in the need for control. I often say to folks, especially people who are serious about practicing yoga or meditation or whatever discipline they have, I say, if your discipline isn't leading to more freedom, it's not working. Mm. Right. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I completely relate to that because for uh, myself and also working so much in the world of illness and chronic illness, there it becomes this sort of obsession with trying to find the cure and fix fix oneself, whatever that is, whether it's a emotional or a physical type of fixing. And so you go down these roads of I'll try this next protocol, then I'll try this next protocol. And there's an anxiety and a stress that comes with that. And there's a peace that if one can find it to just sort of in that moment, accepting what is knowing that you know you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow you don't know what's going to change and there are many possibilities for that change but settling into in this moment yeah. this is where i'm at is is a nice way it's hard to do but a nice way to get rid of some of that clutter of constantly pushing to find the next best answer and you have a number of exercises in your book that are designed to help people calm their nervous systems mm -hmm. and break patterns of responding to stress. And you talk about self-regulation, which includes feeling grounded, centered, and in present time. Can you explain these concepts more? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and I love what you said. I just really want to uplift that, that if we can't accept where we are, we can't get to where we want to be. And that is especially hard, you know, if you're dealing with chronic pain and chronic illness. Um, but my friend Nikki Myers tells this story. She says, you know, if you're in LA and you want to fly to New York, you call the airline and you say, get me a ticket to New York. The first thing they're going to ask you is, where are you? And if you say I'm in San Francisco, you're never going to get to New York, right? We have to speak the truth of where we are so we can get to where we want to be. And so I always love that story and about accepting where we are. And, and that's really hard when where you are is so painful and difficult, but it's such a great point you made. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the other piece of that is I've come to realize through, through work like yours and a bunch of other, you know, great work, because I think those of us, whether we're professionals, healers, or, you know, just people in the world, just doing our greater good, we all need a little bit of help and we need to be reminded that we're not alone and we yeah. need to be reminded that sometimes it's the process, it's not the outcome. I've learned that there are gifts that come from having anxiety, which I have a lot of, and having health problems. And it's sort of like this idea that letting it end if it's supposed to and when it's supposed to so that you don't miss the other uh, blessings that come as a result of it. And you talk about feeling grounded and centered and in present time. And I think those are really important 
um, tools that I'd like for you to explain a little bit about because those types of act actions have helped me accomplish what I want to in terms of feeling better in my own body. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this defining self-regulation, which is what I think we all want. We want to feel comfortable in our own skin. So the idea of being grounded is about feeling like there's something solid, whether it's inside of us or outside of us supporting you. I mean, even people who are listening right now, you can check in and ask yourself, you know, do I feel grounded? Do I feel floaty? You know, can I feel into the places in my body touching the ground, right? Or even like ground through pressure in the arms. Mm -hmm. You know, I notice like even when I talk about it and I look for it, I, I settle a little bit, right? That when we're anxious, our energy is kind of moving up and bubbling up. We're activated. And when we can ground that energy, it can flow through us. A friend of mine who's a musician talked about how whenever she has to set up her sound, there's a grounding cord. I don't know the two technical terms for this, but if you're not grounding the electrical wires, everything kind of gets sparked, right? But when you ground it, everything can move through the wires smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, and so being grounded is that. Being centered is about feeling like we have a, our center of power is inside of us. Again, sometimes anxiety is about feeling like we're not in control. And sometimes we're not, right? But if we can try to be centered in our own being, it can help us deal with the ways that we're not in control of things, right? And so centering practices, even if it's just imagining your sense of center or noticing that you're always focused outside of you, a little bit of like maybe that idea of always looking for cure and you lose your center versus being centered while looking for ways to feel better. Um, and then being in present time. And if we track our thoughts, how often are we thinking about or ruminating or feeling about the past or anticipating the future? So getting present in the moment, whether we're oriented visually or just taking a breath, can often let the nervous system settle so that we can deal with the future or the past. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I noticed when you were talking about grounding and you were you know, touching your arms, I noticed that I felt my feet into the floor a little bit more because mm -hmm. in the excitement of doing, spending time with you, you know, we get elevated, we, we rise up, our body moves up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was mm -hmm. nice to just, oh, fill the floor. And then like right. you said, sometimes just rem remembering to notice, you know, where you're sitting and how that feels, mm -hmm. you automatically respond with yeah. some kind of breath or release. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all need it. I teach this stuff and I still have to remind myself to get grounded. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So for people who've experienced trauma who live with chronic illness or health conditions, there's just a number of reasons why they might not want to live inside their bodies. Yeah. It's scary. It's uncomfortable. It's unfamiliar. And it can feel like you can't trust your own body. How can people begin to trust their bodies and start to use their body as a resource? Yeah, that's such a great question. So when the body feels like the terrain that's unpredictable or untrustworthy, or when there's terror in the body, and we don't want to feel it. It's about going slow. And it's about, so what happens is we become hypervigilant to cues that reinforce that the body is not a safe place to be, right? So I know that when I was at the height of struggling with anxiety, any sensation I would feel, I would assume was anxiety. I was so afraid to have a panic attack mm -hmm. that if I had indigestion, I was worried it was a panic attack. And so I didn't want to be in my body because everything felt like a panic attack, right? So the first thing we want to do is understand that. And then we want to use resourcing and I'll explain that in a moment, to change that pattern. And resourcing is about looking for cues that are good or neutral in the body. Or at first, if the body is too much outside of the body, noticing the color of the trunk of the tree, feeling fingertips. So we slowly start to come back into the moment by deliberately looking for what feels good, tolerable, or neutral knowing that the brain wants to take us to the bad. So we just start slow and we practice that. And then we literally start to build new neural connections mm -hmm. where the good stuff 
or the, and I use neutral as well because for some people, good is a lot to ask for, right? It's too painful. Or the neutral allows us to maybe touch into the stuff we want to avoid without being overwhelmed. Yeah. And so that idea of going slow yeah. and then if it's too uncomfortable to notice what's happening inside the body, you can orient yourself to what's happening outside of the body. You mentioned noticing a color or noticing, you know, something that's happening in the room or a smell, yeah. some kind of sense perhaps that's not, yeah. not as threatening as maybe noticing what's happening inside the body. Yeah, absolutely. And for some survivors, you don't go to the body at all for a while. You're really working with smell, visuals, even sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you don't want to get overwhelmed. Yeah. When I first started doing some um, sensory motor psychotherapy work, which is a lot more, you know, somatic oriented approaches, I realized one thing that would happen is I'd be driving and I'd be in a rush to get somewhere. And inside of me, I'd feel this, you know, rush, you know, I'm going to be late. Something's going to happen if I'm not there on time. Mm -hmm. If I looked outside my window, you know, obviously paying attention to the road, but notice the other cars around me, the other cars are just driving in a flow. Mm -hmm. And that would have that sort of calming effect for me because wow. the rush was inside of me, but looking outside and saying, okay, there's no fires, <laughs> no right. one's speeding, yeah. there's no car accidents. Like it's, it's yeah. a calming way to to start getting comfortable with that mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely i remember for me sometimes when my anxiety was really high i would like look at like the dresser and think some woodworker designed that and they cut it and they built it and i just imagine somebody thinking about building a dresser drawer you know they weren't anxious they were able to build that and that would settle me down beautiful yeah you know i was wondering so what if, for example, someone just starts thinking to themselves, I might get the coronavirus, and they start to consume their mind with this avalanche of physical symptoms, you know, heart racing, maybe some sweating, breathing, okay, increasing. Not able to breathe, all the symptoms of COVID. Yeah. All the symptoms of COVID, you start having this, you know, overwhelming sensation in the body just by having this what if thought, what if I get it? What if I get it? Yeah. Can you give us some examples of ways to use body oriented approaches to release the stress? Absolutely. Um, and I've been very curious about how many people who get COVID also get anxious and it exacerbates their symptoms. And I had a friend who's another somatic experiencing practitioner who was actually hospitalized with COVID. And I was texting with her and she was using all the techniques and she was able to actually watch her oxygen levels go up. She would use grounding and then her breath would start to come back even in the hospital with COVID. And it was so powerful because she could see the immediate results because she was hooked up to all the machines. Yeah. I I'm not surprised, but that is so good to hear. Like yeah. it's just really validating, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, Peter Levine, and um, he wrote a beautiful book called In an Unspoken Voice. And he shares how around in his seventies, he got hit by a car walking across a crosswalk. And so when he was in the ambulance, they were trying to tie him down because his body was wanting to tremble and discharge. And he said to the nurse, don't, don't let my body do what it wants to do. And he was hooked up to a heart rate monitor. And after a few minutes of allowing the shaking and trembling, his heart rate went back into normal. Wow. And there's some data around, if you can get the heart rate back to normal within a certain amount of time, People are less likely to have PTSD symptoms after a traumatic event, right? So he was able to let himself feel grounded, allow the body to do the trembling and the release he wanted to do to restore that balance. Wow. That's a great, yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that like the same tools, we start to have this fear we start to notice the body amplify. You know, the first thing you want to do is just name your sensation. My heart rate is rising. My breath is getting short. I'm sweating. Just name the sensations, right? And then look for that resource. What else do I feel? Mm -hmm. All right, can I feel my feet on the floor? Can I see, you know, the beautiful tree in front of me? Orient to the good or the supportive. And then ask yourself, does anything get better? Because even if it's tiny, sometimes again, we want it to suddenly go away. But mm -hmm. what if the volume goes down a little bit? Then our brain, we want to notice, oh, it got a little better. 
Mm -hmm. And I often say to people, this might be how you can distinguish. Do you have COVID or are you anxious, right? right? If you can use these tools and your sensations change, maybe that's an indicator. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I'm not saying I'm going to diagnose, but it's an indicator of what's going on. Yeah. And using your body as a resource is just that. And I think that part of what you talked about earlier is that the reprogramming and, cha and taking advantage of those neural pathways, the practice of each time you notice a little something different that mm -hmm. shifts in the body, you're also giving your brain a different way to relate to yourself. And that's forming new pathways. It's breaking exactly. old patterns. Exactly. It's not easy to break old patterns. It takes, it not. takes some time. Yeah. And that, you know, that goes without being said that this trauma and anxiety and stress are, they're real and yes. they are things that so many people deal with. And it's not something that really any of us should have to go through alone. And so being able to give voice to it and talk to a primary care physician, seeing a licensed mental health therapist, you have some resources in your book where people can go. There are a number of psychotherapy techniques that are for trauma. So people should ask for help and, and have support in going through trauma with a professional. I mean, that's really, really Absolutely. essential. I've had it, you've probably had it. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, we're not meant, we're relational beings and healing is not something you need to do alone. And that's why, you know, in the book, I start with these individual tools, but then the book goes on to say, I don't expect you to ground yourself out of your trauma. You know, we need relationships. We need to be supported. So important. Yeah. Yeah, you, so I love ballroom dance and it's been fundamental to my own healing and trusting my body and using it as a resource. And for years I was told I needed to do yoga mm -hmm. and people tried to make me fit into a model that was supposed to work for me. Mm -hmm. But when I tried yoga, I felt like a failure and many times I felt worse than I did before I started. Mm. And I understand now, because I've had more time in my life to, to work through these things and get help, that the silence and the breathing and the body awareness was just too threatening for me. And I really needed help in order to safely build a relationship with my body. And when I read about your focus on trauma-informed yoga, it was like a breath of fresh air to me. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about this because I think it's special that you are, you know, using this trauma informed approach in your work. Mm, yeah. And I totally get that, you know, that, and, and I also think that there's something about dance that's such medicine too, right? Yeah. Um, and for some of us, a yoga practice that's too quiet, too focused on the body, it's just too much, right? It's like, it's like the, suddenly the, the lights are on too loud, everything is too much, right? So, you know, I always say that any any style of yoga can be trauma informed. So some people need to move slow, but for some nervous systems, that's just gonna be activating. We don't wanna be sitting with all of it. We need to be moving a little swifter, maybe have music on as a resource, yes. right? So everybody has different needs. And for some people, it's not gonna be yoga. I mean, I'll be honest, for me, dance and singing especially I think because I teach yoga, so maybe it's also connected to that, but I can get connected to such healing in those modalities as well. But I think that, especially for trauma survivors or anybody, all of us, if we are curious about yoga, because maybe we think the stretching will be good or the benefits are good, remember that there's so many different ways people teach yoga these yeah. days. And so, you know, I have one client who really is dealing with complex trauma and she needs classes with music in the background that move quick because she needs to feel a flow in her body. Maybe similar to the experience of dance, right? Where it's not about static holding, but actually flowing in a nervous system that maybe doesn't feel the flow. Something that offers that rhythm is really healing. Yeah, that's really a good point, Hala. And I appreciate that your message is very strongly individualized yeah. it's like each person and really respecting the individual needs of people and and how to find that fit and i think there is some some truth to that that music is very soothing and automatically can calm the nervous system so having the music component with the movement has been the gift of my life yeah. but it's also really comforting for me to know because there's so many things about yoga that 
are clearly, you know, healing, therapeutic, beneficial. And I just like the idea that, you know, you're doing your work out there to bring an awareness to what you just said about each person mm -hmm. and that, you know, different types of yoga, different types of practices are really important to explore for people. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's really about not shaming people. We, there's not a one size fits all. And the worst thing we can do to survivors is say, well, here's the tool. It, it, this will work for you. And then on top of the pain of dealing with trauma, then there's the shame of, oh my God, and the thing didn't work for me. It's supposed to work for me. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Or what's wrong with me? Why am I not okay? You know, yeah. being silent in my body or why is it that I just kind of want to run away from my body the more that I'm there? And now it's becoming more understood for people like myself through books like yours and Peter Levine, who's been around for a very long time. But as th this content becomes more mainstream, yeah. people will start to understand that there are reasons why they gravitate towards certain ways of healing and maybe not so much others. And it's a slow and patient process of finding mm -hmm. the right place. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you, you emphasize, as you mentioned a couple times already, that we absolutely need connection with others for survival. And you make a statement that as much as fight or flight is a natural stress response, so is tend and befriend. Yet for some reason, we value running away rather more so than the connections. And this is especially complicated right now in lieu of social distancing and also with increased use of technology. But would you mind describing tend and befriend? Yeah. So the tend and befriend response is something that researchers were finding. Well, there was a little bit of a gender difference in the beginning. Most research on stress was done on men, cisgender men. And their stress response tended to be more of a fight or flight response. And what they found with women, when they started doing more research with women, was that women also tend to produce oxytocin when we're stressed. So the oxytocin is a bonding chemical so that when we feel stressed, we're also wanting to create connection. We're more likely to want to talk about it with other people versus isolate. So, you know, regardless of one's gender, reflecting on how we're socialized, right? So are we socialized that when we're stressed, we have to separate, be on our own, or are we socialized to extend ourselves to others? On a primitive level, tend and befriend you know, I think might also be connected to the different roles people played. You know, if you're caring for children or, or el the elderly and then a bear comes, you're not going to run. You're going to figure out how to get everybody to safety together. Or you're going to figure out how to collaborate. How do I look at the threat and figure out how to create collaboration to mitigate that threat? So I feel like, you know, just seeing the rise of nationalism in our world, like the, the all pervasiveness of racism in our world and sexism, we're very divided. And then with the COVID pandemic, everybody is stressed. We're having to isolate. And we see these divisions getting stronger. People have these online relationships now or, or interactions and it's so divisive. How can we be stressed and connected is something that I often ask. Yeah, because you make such an important point that it's a natural response to managing stress is to also connect with other people and have that social engagement. I think sometimes we forget because, you know, for the most part, we we all have some type of relationship in our lives and we don't recall, we don't think about just how important the relationship is to calming our nervous system. Yeah. And that's relationships with pets, relationships, you know, with nature. I mean, it's, it's a, I know you talk very broadly about rituals of connection and you know how to be um, in a collective interdependence, interdependence. Yeah, yeah. To feel like there's something bigger than us that's holding us. You know, people, unhappy people are very self-centered. We get very focused on our unhappiness. We feel lonely. We feel isolated, right? So when we can extend our sense of self beyond ourselves, a it pulls some of our obsession or our attention off the unhappiness not in a way to deny it, but also in a way to include something else. Mm -hmm. And it allows us to feel held by something bigger than us. And so the pain can become more manageable sometimes. Yeah, because you said in your book that when we don't feel connected to something bigger than our pain, our pain overcomes us 
and we focus more on strategies to avoid pain rather than embracing life to its fullest. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love what you just said, because one of the things I was going to ask you is, you know, how, how is that possible? How do people get the most out of life? And you said that there's that feeling of being held by something bigger than yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the way we do that is we have to actually have rituals that remind us, even if it's I mean, I'll go sit in my backyard and just like stare at a tree for five minutes. And it's like, wow, oh my gosh, you know, but when I don't do that, which is most days, cause I'm not always that great at it, right? <laughs> You're not near the I, tree. <laughs> I, you know, it's like, I have to remember these things that, you know, I tend to be like a worker bee and I feel like I should always be working or giving to my kids. So even though I write, wrote this book, right. I also need to remember these things and we don't have to go on like a, five day retreat in nature to connect with nature. Like you can stare at your plant in your, in your room. It's really about where we place our attention. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, back to what you had said about trauma, you made a statement in the book, which I think is a fresh perspective on how we view trauma. You said trauma and the way to heal from trauma is not merely an individual process, but sometimes in focusing on our individual responsibility, you actually blame the victim and that larger systems must be held accountable, which include institutional trauma, systemic social injustices that also traumatize so many. And I, I appreciate what you said there because it's easy to get focused on, I have the problem. And, and we as a society focus on individuals often too much. Absolutely. And I think especially individuals who are not taken care of by society. And so they're traumatized because their bodies are at risk, their minds are at risk, their dignity is at risk. When we then pathologize them, you know, I often say to folks, this is a normal response to an abnormal situation. Mm -hmm. Of course you're overwhelmed. Of course you're stressed. It's not because you're not strong enough or you lack the grit life is asking you to carry too much. Mm -hmm. So those distinctions are so important. It's not a level playing field, whether we're dealing with systemic issues or chronic illness and pain, right? Like everybody is carrying different levels of different weights. And it's also not about comparing who's carrying more, but it's about making the distinction about where our pain is coming from. And the thing with institutionalized or systemic trauma is the control is not inside of us. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a black person, you can do all the therapy in the world, but if you walk outside and you are de dealt with in a racist manner, or there's violence on your body because of your race or your transgender, you know, these days, so many different people are targeted. Yeah. It, it's not their personal work. They, the personal work can help them cope, but the systems have to actually change yeah. versus people that are dealing with more personal trauma. Right, exactly. And, and I think that's just such an important, your, your book starts out with more like an individual approach, but as the book evolves, you go through this micro level, then you go into this very macro level where you focus on not just the individual and their environment, but the systems that are around them and that they're interacting with you know, every day. And so I, I thank you for that because I think that's super important in looking at the big picture of anxiety and stress and trauma. Yeah. And you use the, the word, the global heart. And you said that it's so important to see the humanity in others, even those that we may not understand, even those who have hurt us. And can you just reiterate why you feel that's important in the process of managing stress and anxiety? Yeah, so I think it goes back again to this idea of seeing ourselves as relational beings embedded in this larger context of the world. And the world is so big and it's so easy to feel disconnected from each other. You know, in yoga, often what is what we say is that the separation is the disease. This illusion that we're separate from each other is traumatic. Mm -hmm. So rehumanizing those we've dehumanized in whatever way is appropriate, right? So if you're a target, I might not say to you, well, you've got to rehumanize the people who are targeting you. Maybe that's not your work right now. Really that self-care is, right? Eventually, yeah, that will be part of the healing. Um, but especially if, you know, so many of the relationships we have in our life are invisible. Like, who made my clothes? Who, who 
were the farmers who made my food. And I'm like thinking about how some of my choices might come on the backs of other people's well-being. You know, that that's also a form of trauma is being part of a system that privileges some at the expense of so many. So again, in order to deal with that, very nice people have to cut off from the truth of the impact of their comfort. So even though it's heartbreaking to acknowledge um, poverty and oppression, when we do, when we rehumanize those who we never see around us, it does bring more meaning. And then if we can, it allows us to make some different choices that bring even more meaning to our lives. Right. And all of this will help us feel more integrated. Yeah. yeah, right. That we're part of something bigger than ourselves yeah. and that we're all together as one, really. Yeah, yeah. And even though we have different roles in that, we can feel that it's a collaboration. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I really do love the idea of seeing the humanity in others because it's really easy to get caught up in um, anger and frustration and not feeling like you're deserving and not feeling worthy. And I have found that sometimes that when I carry that um, negativity inside of my body, it really feeds some of the anxiety that I always can carry because then I don't trust and then I, I lose perspective. And that reminds me a little bit of the book of joy, the Dalai Lama, oh, yes. Desmond Tutu. It reminds me a little bit of, you know, the message in the book of joy. Such a beautiful book. You know, the yeah. idea that like even our grief can be the thing that tenderizes our hearts to the greatest joy. Right. Yeah. Which you touch on as well in peace from anxiety. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's, it's quite obvious from our brief time together that you cover a lot of content in your book. It's fantastic. I'm really, I'm blessed that it came into my life yeah. in sort of a synchronous sort of way. I love how those things happen. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of questions I could continue to ask, but I know our time is limited. So can you please share with people where they can go to access your other resources? Yeah, I mean, the book is sold on all the major websites, but of course, we want to try to support our local bookstores. And so mm -hmm. if your local bookstore has it, uh, try to buy it from there. And, you know, my website, which is my name, holacory.com, I've got tons of resources. I have a membership community where folks can be in community together and we meet live and I send practices to people. And that's been really, really powerful. It's called Radical Wellbeing. Um, and so on my website, you can find all the lots of classes to take and talks and workshops and the membership. And you also have yoga videos. You have yeah. uh, a lot of um, brief exercise videos that show ways to calm and ground and be present. Mm -hmm. So for people who just need, you know, a couple minutes here and there, I find that to be really helpful just to go find a video and be able to join you in collaboration yeah. in grounding and centering and feeling more present. Yeah, we put a lot of them up on, on YouTube now. So you can just go to YouTube, which is my name, Hala Corey, and we put like short videos on there as well. Yeah, it's definitely a gift, a gift to the world that you are, that yeah. you're giving. Thank so. you so much, Casey. Well, Hala, thanks for taking the time to meet with me and I wish you very well on the, the next steps. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was so much fun talking with you.